Hello, dear friends. We are going to be taking a look at a classic work, Chantel Mouffe, The Return of the Political. If you've taken any political theory or political science class, you've probably already read this work. But we're going to read the introduction for uh, 2020. I think that's the year. So let's take a look at Chantel Mouffe. Now, this is a very important text. It's going to be part of our Leo Strauss. If the university structure didn't suck, and everything was A-OK, -okay, then I would probably be in class teaching this or w working on this as the university has dissipated. We come to YouTube instead and we do our collective thinking on YouTube. Everybody else is making videos about TikTok and dancing and everything, and I have to make a series on Leo Strauss for some reason. Everybody's having so much fun, and here we are doing the hard work of figuring out why everything sucks in our age. So let's take a look, not long though. Introduction for an agnostic pluralism. The trick is not to fool oneself about certain things, small rocky islands in the sea of self-deception. Clutching them and not drowning is the utmost that human beings achieve. Not long ago, we were being told to the accompaniment of much fanfare that liberal democracy had won and that history had ended. Alas, far from having produced a smooth transition to pluralist democracy, the collapse of communism seems in many places to have opened the way to a resurgence of nationalism and the emergence of new antagonists. Western Democrats view the astonished Western Democrats view the astonishment the explosion of manifold ethnic, religious, and nationalist conflicts that they thought belonged to a bygone age. Instead, the heralded New World Order, the victory of universal values, and the generalization of post-conventional identities, we are witnessing an explosion of particularisms and an increasing challenge to Western universalism. Now, we're going to be disagreeing with some of the things that Chantal Mouffe says, especially this part. Instead of the new the victory of universal values and the generalization of post-conventional identities. These two things don't go together, right? Raymond Goyce is really important here. Raymond Goyce says that there's a concom concomitance of various concepts, freedom, democracy, all these things within the liberal framework that just do not go together. And the one that's important for us here, the generalization of post-conventional identities, what I would call on my channel, neoliberal subjectivity, because yes, we are free to create our own subjectivities in our modern world, but most of the time, those creations end up being recreations of past and cost-benefit analysis. So we end up re recapitulating, right? Re recreating those hierarchical structures even within our supposed ability to create our own identities or have post-conventional identities as they say here or to create ourselves all of these live laugh pray in india was that long pray eat pray love in india as much as we could do that those identities still end up reproducing old ideas of old hierarchies and uh, that's one of the things that we try to point to and remember one another thing that in my Leo Strauss series is going to be important and we talked about this with Perens was how jo uh, Joshua Perens the last work was how there is this push to say that there is no for example holy family there is no holy public sphere if you look at the idea of Selah Ben Habib there is no holy public sphere as Hannah Arendt and Leo Strauss like to uphold. On the other hand, the real, so the idea is that there is no holy space, but the real idea that is a problem here is the idea that there is a valid distinction between the secular and the sacred. That is, that distinction between, that there is no valid distinction between secular and sacred comes before the idea that there is no valid distinction between the market and the social or the public sphere or that everything is comes down to a market logic i hope that was made clear well once again i'm going to make this say this one more time the idea is that where progressive leftists today have opened up this idea of civil war within our everyday lives everything is a politicization everything is a matter of privilege and emotional labor cost benefit analysis everything is civil war in that sense they operate on an even earlier distinction between the secular and the sacred something that's evolved 
out of Western Christian society. We looked at people like Leo Strauss, who likes to differentiate between the Greeks and the Jews, the Athens and Jerusalem. We can see that in the Jerusalem side, what, what we've learned is that the distinction between secular and sacred becomes ever more blur. And if you look at my Ritual Traces series, you can see that all those ancient Greek philosophers would try to, for example, create one of the first places where secular and sacred are differentiated even before Jesus. Even they would participate in these benign rituals like cutting up a pigeon to see if you would win a battle. Those kinds of rituals were just unquestioned, even though Socrates would question everything. Taken by surprise, by such a convincing refutation of their optimistic forecasts, many liberals have reacted by evoking the deferred effects of totalitarianism or a new upsurge of the archaic. They respond that, see, these are basically civilizers. The liberals are the people who are trying to civilize the world. They've always been trying to do that through colonialism, etc. They respond as if it represented only a temporary delay on the road that necessarily leads to the universalization of liberal democracy. Now. I can come up with a much stronger argument for liberalism than MOF does here. Again, we live in a time where we don't do the grace of, even though I disagree obviously with the liberalism, I could at least make a better argument than this. A short parenthesis before rationality reimposes order, or a last desperate, desperate cry of the political before it's definitively destroyed by the forces of law and universal reason. Or rather the forces of the market. So the much stronger argument here, taken over by law and universal reason, it's taken over by market. And that's the difference between neoliberalism and liberalism. So what people, and because it is true that neoliberal market universal reason, not necessarily the forces of law, but rather the forces of neoliberal law, uh, that system, it is in fact true that it is taking over the world. and it is a revolt against a neoliberal order that is winning, more or less. And instead of that power being used by leftists in a revolutionary fashion, it's being repressed because the revolutionary movement focuses instead on what the materialists and non-materialists are fighting over about. I think it's a mute argument about whether materialism is more important or, or, or idealism is more important. I don't think it really matters. I think it's a chicken and egg argument. But right now, the stupid poll camp is hearkening down onto materialism as if that's going to save. It doesn't really matter for me. I think that the cultural... See, the distinction here shouldn't be between cultural Marxists. The distinction should be between cultural Marxists and the communists and between the critical race theory people, the intersectionality people, the feminism allied to market forces, that should be the distinction, not the distinction between cultural Marxism. When people say like cultural Marxism, oh, you're using that term, you must not be educated. No, there is a cultural Marxism movement and they want to have basically the culture of a socialist culture pervades that is within our everyday rituals, within our ontological creations that goes against the neoliberal market culture and the reason why it doesn't win even though the power of that is through collectivity through non-alienation there could be a lot of power in that non-market collective movement building if you ever participate in those kinds of structures i occupy those were amazing those were really powerful much more powerful than the non-willing kind of work of neoliberal group action <laughs> Um, which really runs on ideas such as Fordian ideas like uh, economies of scale that only work to alienate us and then exploit our surplus capital and then call that adding value. Okay, because it is indeed the political which is at stake here and the possibility of its elimination. Now, here, Mof, because she's a political philosopher, now, we can see that within MOF, we can see the debate between the things that we need to root out, the personal is political ideas, and the actual, the, the dying politics, the dying political sphere. Here, we notice that MOF is trying to save the political in some sense, but doesn't realize that other things that she says really go against that 
idea that Leo Strauss is trying to do, or Hannah Arendt is trying to do, which is, or Habermas is trying to do, and we disagree with Habermas, I'm going to disagree with Habermas on my channel, uh, coming up, uh, it's hard work, guys, this is hard philosophy, so if you are interested, please like, subscribe, share, so it's going to be coming, though, the work on Habermas, we just have to work on Leo Strauss a, a little bit, and before we start getting into even more difficult work. And soon I think that the work of Leo Strauss here will be recognized in maybe 50 years as being quite seminal. And uh, he's going to be the, maybe perhaps even a Heideggerian level thinker in the future. Because it is indeed the political which is at stake here and the possibility of its elimination and the incapacity of liberal thought to grasp its nature and irreducible character of antagonism that explains the impotence of most political theorists in the current situation. An impotence that, at the time of profound political change, could have devastating po political consequences for democratic politics. And you see, this word impotence isn't uh, is key here because we are talking about masculinity we are talking about feminism you can see that she is in fact taking a side with this word it's an interesting word okay so yeah it is an impotence but what are what is the psychologically philosophically motivated by the collective impotence this evasion of the political could i believe jeopardize the hard won conquests of the democratic revolution and you can see how there are conquests of democratic revolution which is why in the essay included in the essays included in this volume i take issue with the conception of politics that informs a great deal of democratic thinking today this conception can be characterized as rationalist universalist and individualist She's and we're going to be talking about how a lot of the people that critique universalism have, of course, a universalism in their own right. I argue that its main shortcomings is that it cannot be... I argue that its main shortcomings is that it cannot but remain blind to the specificity of the political in its dimension of conflict decision, and that it cannot perceive the constitutive role of antagonisms in social life. With the demise of Marxism, the illusion that we can finally dispense with the notion of antagonism has become widespread. This belief is fraught with danger, since it leaves us unprepared in the face of unrecognized manifestations of antagonism. A lot of people, right, both the left and the right, have re recognized that there is, in fact, civil war, and that civil war is inescapable. But that's basically what we learn from Strauss is that civil war is inevitable, but we need a place to have that civil war reasonably, and that's what politics is all about, the place to have that civil war. But because now that there is, the personal has become political, there is no specific regulated place where we can have our politics in the public sphere where civil war can happen. Now, every aspect of our lives is civil war, and our families are civil war. Uh, not just civil war, and that's basically, basically the market as well. The market is a form of that civil war, is a form of that regulated civil war. It's better than real war. <laughs> In an attempt to bring about much needed corrective to the liberal vision, several pieces below engage with the work of Carl Schmitt. Schmidt's critique of liberal democracy constitutes, in my view, a challenge that we cannot ignore. Yet I also agree, think that, by revealing the deficiencies of liberalism, he can help us, unwittingly, to identify the issues that need to be addressed and thereby to gain a better understanding of the nature of modern democracy. So you can see that with this engagement with Nazis like Schmidt, she is going against one of the ideas of current current ideas that believe that civil war is inevitable, which is that we shouldn't read people that we disagree with. And that's happening on both sides. Both sides are burning books and then calling the other side as the book burners. My objective is to think that Schmidt against Schmidt and to use his insights in order to strengthen liberal democracy against his critiques. It's most likely going to be Strauss against, against Schmidt. By drawing our attention to the centrality of the friend-enemy relations in politics, Schmidt makes us aware of the dimension of the political that is linked to the existence of the element of hostility among human beings. That's exactly it, right? That's what the politics is about. This can make 
This can take many forms and manifest itself in very different types of social relations. This is an important idea, which I have tried to reformulate within the framework of the contemporary critique of essentialism that I take to constitute the most fruitful theoretical approach to pluralist democracy. Wonderful. But again, so we can see that she has an understanding of why things are the way they are, but she still goes back and forth and she's not as radical as me in terms of really sussing out what is it that brought us to the point in which politicization is everywhere. When we accept the very identity, when we accept that every identity is a, when we accept that every identity is relational and that the condition of existence of every identity is the affirmation of the difference, the determination of an other that is going to play the role of a constituted outside, it is possible to understand how antagonisms arise. That's a very amazing shorthand destruction of essentialism. So we're going to read it again. When we accept that every identity is relational and the condition of existence of every identity is the affirmation of a different, the determination of an other that is going to play the role of a constitutive outside, it is possible to understand how antagonisms arise. In the domain of collective identification, where that, where what is in question is the creation of a we, by the delimination of a them, the possibility always exists that this we-them relation will turn into a relation of friend-enemy type. In other words, tribalism. In other words, it can also become political in Schmidt's understanding of the term. This can happen when the other, who was until the then considered only under the mode of difference, begins to perceive as begins to be per, begins to be perceived as negating our identity. This can happen when the other, who was until then considered only under the mode of a difference, begins to be perceived as negating our identity, as putting in question our very existence. From that moment onwards, any type of we-them relation, be it religious, ethnic, national, economic, or other, becomes a site of political antagonism. As a consequence, the political cannot be restricted to a certain type of institution or envisaged as constituted a specific sphere or level of society it must be conceived as a dimension that is inherent to every human society and that determines our ontological condition. <sighs> Here is very interesting because we're going to go further and we're going to talk about what Philip von Wassel calls the theopolitics of culture. It's theopolitics so that politics and again we go back the secular and the sacred there is no separation between church and state. All of our laws are based on Christian ideals of inherent human worth and all these kinds of things. It's all Christian. So a couple of years ago, the whole atheist movement that came around, it's ridiculous, actually, because not only have we had Kant, you know, there's a kind of religiosity within our ontology. Not only have we had Spinoza, who also has his own kind of religiosity, even though he tries to, he's the closest to get to secularity, I think, possible through Spinoza. Even with the Christian atheism of Zizek, right, even through that we need the fragmentation of the absolute, which means that there was some sort of ontological religious sphere, right? Now, we have to also keep in mind Derrida's question here of using the word religion as a kind of universalism, or what he calls a Latinization of the world, where we look at, so this is why I don't look at religion, in fact, I will look at ritual, I say as ritual, as being my universal, because I, I think that it's, it's less narrativistic, ritual, it comes even, it's more gesturific, but there is this ontological condition that is created from our rituals, and one of those strains is connected to politics in a very intimate manner. And we can look at the work of Agamben, who is studying oikonomia. Oikonomia is the economic considerations of theology, is oikonomia. The economic considerations of theology goes really, is really old. And those economic con conditions of theology is basically, this is why in Islam, for example, there is no separation of church and state. In many type of religions, there is no separation of church and state. And this, I think, in the Christian world is a lie. It's a lie that makes things kind of worse. If we, I think, 
were to admit more that there is a theology within our legal system, there is a theology within our psychology, there's a theology within, you know, even psychology, who is the worst at, is the one of the worst offenders at um, maintaining scientism, because in the psychologists do reflect in our medical sphere, they create pills for whatever the label is, and then they make mad amounts of money. So there's an economic aspect to that. And then they also have this legal power, this institutional power. So in the realm of psychology is specifically brought with this problem, the problem being that we've come to a conclusion that there is a, for example, whole, that the public sphere is not holy, that the family is not holy, that our intersubjective relationships, that there can be no holy, non-materialistic, or you know, seeing the other person as an end in themselves. That is, if you look at that Harvard paper, a form of bringing in your bias into your philosophy, as that psychological paper was critiquing the Kantian philosophy. If you're interested in that, I can send you that paper. Okay? Those ideas, they come from um, obscuring this obscuring. They say that you know this realm is not holy, and this realm uh, is actually one of economics. So they say that, but then that whole thing operates on its own universality, its own universality of saying what, saying that we can in fact separate the secular and the sacred, which in fact we've never done. So this is what this line is so important. It must be conceived as a dimension that is inherent to every human society and that it determines our very ontological condition. So it's more complicated than saying that politics determines ontology. It's more about how the rituals that we imbue have a political nature to them and that they are, I don't, I don't like to use that word, nature, but they have a political aspect to them and that they help to inform or condition our ontology. Okay. Such a view of the political is profoundly at odds with liberal thought, which is precisely the reason for the bewilderment of this thought when confronted with the phenomenon of hostility in its multiple forms. That's it, right? This is why people call the return of the religious. It's not a return of the religious. It just never left. We just fooled ourselves into thinking that we are escaping theological thinking when in fact we're not. So every everyone, all of these atheists who have, haven't have done the hard work right, of actual atheism, um, they, they wouldn't realize that to get to actual atheism is almost more or less an impossibility because we are so stewed in various ontotheologies and various ideologies. It's almost impossible to get to that state of fragmented absolute. This is particularly evident in its incomprehension of political movements, which are seen as expressions of the so-called masses. Since they cannot be apprehended to individualistic terms, these movements are usually regulated to the pathological or deemed to be the expressions of irrational forces. Exactly. And one of the ways that we see this is with the phrase, you know, with the phrase that they say, they're voting against their interests. They're vote, the right wing is, vote, no, they're not voting against their interests. They have a rationality. They have a way of thinking about the world. They're voting against their interests is this, again, uh, another form of this colonialism, this internal colonialism that happens uh, within the West itself. The West is an internal colonizing regime before it starts to export its colonialism. First, it has to basically destroy the multiculturalism it has within itself before it goes and destroys the multiculturalism of others and starts turning great complicated societies into mono, monolithic capital producing eight centric legal entities that are filled with offices offices that distinct distinct have a distinction between their official duties their office duties and the ecclesiastical duties or the other you know the ritualistic kind of things and you can see the return of the ritual return of the religious come back with uh, how there are land acknowledgments that are not really land acknowledgments acknowledge acknowledgement so now you can see in every pretty much every canadian institution any event that you go to there's like a guy with a uh you know a piece of paper he's like this land was once the oshinabi or something and like 
can't even pronounce it and he reads this piece of paper and he says we are we regret colonialism please don't ask us for <laughs> reparations uh, he does this like terrible and it's become so ter it's just this like official duty when in fact that role I'm not saying that role shouldn't exist. I'm saying that role should be an ecclesiastical duty and there shouldn't be this lie between the secular and the sacred. Right now, when there is a lie between the secular and sacred, uh, when, we, when we go, when we don't have a legal system that acknowledges its theopolitical, theological backing, right? When we, and it's, the whole thing is based on this like super rationalistic thing that doesn't, recognize its theological basis and so when we don't do that uh, we have a very hypocritical society in some sense because we do have the the theological land acknowledgement a completely official position a p completely secular official position and so we don't do either of those roles really well when in fact if we don't have that distinction we can have a real you know, shaman and a real 20 minute sacredness, a real 20 minute meditation session, and then we can start whatever we're going to do. And let's compare that to the Islamic idea of la ilaha illallah, right? So in that, or various kinds of bismillah rahman rahim is what they say, for example, before they do anything. So but when they do it, it's almost, it's absolutely not official. There's no official thing about it. It's very religious. And the, I guess the problem there becomes, it's a very similar problem in that it becomes very performative. So in that sense, you have a lot of these like, you see this video of like uh, Syrian, uh, of Iranian soldiers in Syria who, I saw this video of this Iranian soldier in Syria who's like washing himself in a bucket and he's singing the song. And then once he notices the camera, he, he switches the song into a super Islamic song. Or, and it's the same thing actually happened recently with uh, regards to a mullah. He was doing something non-Islamic, notice the, the camera, makes it super Islamic. So there is a performative act, action there. But there is also, you can see that the, there is no lie between that there is no secular in the, in the sacred. So when he is doing that really Islamic song, he's still doing like a spiritual Sufi song. He's still doing uh, something that is still in a way spiritual in itself. I think that before, once again, the, the main outline here is that before the distinction between this idea that there is no non-economic space, that there is no holy space, that the distinction there is that there is no non-secular space. There is no non-secular space. Even though, and it's better to say it in the negative than rather than saying everything is religious, rather than saying everything is religious, you say there is no non-secular space, because then that way you could include non-Latin religiosities or theocracies or spiritualities or uh, other types of liminal spaces, we can say. So, on the eve of the 21st century, our societies are undergoing a deep process of redefinition of their collective identities and experiencing the establishment of new political frontiers. This is linked to the collapse of communism and the disappearance of the democracy totalitarianism opposition since the Second World War had provided the main political frontier enabling discrimination between friend and enemy. This disappearance confronts us with a double situation. In the former communist bloc, the unity created in the common struggle against communism has vanished and the friend-enemy frontier is taking a multiplicity of new forms linked to the resurgence of old antagonisms, ethnic, national, religious, and others. Well, Putin has come back since then, so I'm not sure about that one. In the West, it is very it is the very identity of democracy which is at stake, in so far as it has depended to a large extent on the existence of the communist other that constituted its negation. Now, again, we have the Russian other again. So now that the enemy has been defeated and the meaning of democracy itself has become blurred and needs to be redefined by the creation of a new frontier. This is much more difficult for the moderate right and for the left and the radical right. Now, you can see that because of these two theses, this was written in 2020. So it's already kind of, it's already dated. So these two theses themselves already presuppose the end of history thesis. Even though she's trying to undermine that end of history thesis, she ends up here, she's upholding it in a totally another way by critiquing it, by trying to critique it. This is so weird. It is provided by within 
For the latter, the immigrants, which are presented by the different movements of the extreme right as a threat to cultural identity and national sovereignty of the true Europeans. I submit that the growth of the extreme right in several countries in Europe can only be understood in the context of the deep crisis of political identity that confronts liberal democracy, following the loss of traditional landmark of politics. It is linked to the necessity of redrawing the political frontier between friend and enemy. We are in a conjuncture. So we, <laughs> people usually make fun of the word conjuncture or conject it's funny because it's funny because we usually make fun of the word conjuncture when it's used critical in conjunction you know we are in a conjuncture when in the capacity of liberalism to apprehend the political so it's funny because people usually make fun of the word conjuncture like critical conjuncture conjunction when talking about or creating a paper but she uses the word here we are in a conjuncture where the incapacity of liberalism to apprehend the political could have very serious consequences. All those who believe that the fall of communism would necessarily be followed by the establishment of pluralist democracy and the destruction of the old antagonists could only herald a great advance for democracy are quite unable to understand that specificity of the new situation. For that reason, it is vital that we abandon a theoretical perspective that prevents us coming to terms with the nature of the tasks before us. Once we accept the necessity of the political and the impossibility of a world without antagonism, what needs to be envisioned is how to possible under how to how it is possible un what needs to be envisioned is how it is possible under those conditions to create and maintain a pluralistic democratic order. Such an order is based on a distinction between enemy and adversary. It requires that within the context of the political community, the opponent should be considered not as an enemy to be destroyed, but as, as an adversary whose existence is legitimate and must be tolerated. We will fight against his ideas, but we will not question his right to defend them. Now that goes against, again, that goes against what's happening here. We are questioning people's rights to defend it. So the idea is no longer that I disagree with what you say, but I will defend you in saying it. Now, it's not that at all. The category of the enemy does not disappear, but is displaced. It remains pertinent with respect to those who do not accept the democratic rules of the game and who thereby exclude themselves from the political community. It remains pertinent. So here she's marking out that she is on the side of democracy here. Now that's interesting. Now that is interesting. I wonder if she's been excommunicated yet. Liberal democracies require consensus on the rules of the game, but it also calls for the constitution of collective identities around clearly differentiated positions and the possibility of choosing between real alternatives. This agonistic pluralism is constitutive of modern democracy and rather than seeing it as a threat, we should realize that it represents the very condition of existence of such democracy. Okay, now we're going to get into the Lumen-Habermas debate soon. Lumen has argued that the specificity of liberal democracy as a political system is the splitting of the summit, the distinction between government and opposition. He specifies that this presupposes a con corresponding binary oppositional program, conservative progressive or since it doesn't work anymore, restrictive or expansive welfare state politics, that's a really good distinction right here. Or if the economy does not permit this, then ecological versus economic preferences. That's also going to be a, I, I like this distinction really well, but I think that economic versus ecological is going to be, that distinction is going to soon fade away. I think it's going to be the same decision sooner or later because of how bad the ecological gets. The ecological and the economic aren't even going to be aren't even going to be at a, a opposition any any longer. It's going to be, and I I know this because um, I run these games with my classes where they do basically this game where they can choose between their own individual nations. So they're all in different nations, and then they have to compete in the world economy. But there's also global warming, and they all have to compete to become the most successful nation but they have to balance out their individual nation interests versus the world ecological interest and you can see that those two things the world economic interests and the ecological interests sooner or later in the long run not in my games but in the long run in my hypothesis is that those two things are going to become more and more the same like when you have to invade a land because they have freshwater resources, and if you don't have a freshwater resources, that's going to be an economic decision. That's an economic decision. It's the difference between the wars of the past, which were ideological. You can see that the fascist regimes 
would make non-economic choices in order to further their fascist ends. Whereas I don't see that that difference between ecological and economic preferences any longer being the case in the future. Right now it is, but in the future. Only in this way can possible directions of the political course be put to choice. This means that the current blurring of political frontiers between left and right is harmful for democratic politics as it impedes constitution of distinct political identities. This in turn fosters disaffection towards political parties and discourages participation in the political process. Hence, the growth of other collective identities around religious, nationalist, or ethnic forms of identification. This conforms, confirms, as Schmidt has pointed out, the antagonisms can take many forms and it is illusory to believe that they could ever be eliminated. Now, who does do that is this idea of intersectionality, right? That does this as well. That on the one hand, the left is presuming that that civil war exists everywhere. And on the other hand, there is also presumption that there is intersectional unity within the left as well. And that those eliminate those those antagonisms have been eliminated for on the internal aspect as well. But it hasn't been eliminated, it's just been silenced. In those circumstances, it is preferable to give them a political outlet within a pluralistic democratic system. The great strength of liberal democracy, case Schmidt, is precisely that it provides the institutions that, if properly understood, can shape the element of hostility in a way that diffuses its potential. Indeed, as Elias Kanati shows in Crowds and Power, the parliamentary system exploits the psychological structure of struggling armies and should be conceived as a struggle in which the contending parties renouncing the killing of each other and accept the verdict of the majority on who has won. According to him, the actual vote is decisive as the moment in which the one is really measured against the other it is all that is left of the original lethal clash. It is played out in many forms with threats, abuse, and physical propagation which may lead to blows or missiles. But the counting of the vote ends. We have to notice one more thing here is that the only people worth, again, the only people worth listening to in this situation are those willing to put their lives on the line. Those who are willing to put their lives on the line should have this possibility of participating in the public sphere. What do we have in politics today? Nobody wants to put their life on the line. Who wants to defend our democracy in a kind of reawakening of a democratic potential, Ukraine, or at least that's what some of the popular media would like us to think. Of course, most of us have been too, in the West at least, most of us have been too disaffected to actually vote. But the counting of the vote ends the battle. If we accept such a view, it follows that parties can play an important role in giving expression to social division and the conflict of wills. But if they fail in their job, conflicts will assume other guises and it will be more difficult to manage them democratically. So this is, again, this is a complete refutation of this idea of the personal as being political. We have to basically push all of that antagonism within politics and keep it maintained there. But what the feminists have done is basically open the Pandora's box. Instead of having a public sphere that is where the conflict happens, there is no public sphere. Everything is privatized. Even our emotions are privatized now. And even our emotions, even our intersubjective relationships are a site of so that you have all of these hordes of undergraduates who go out into society and you know call people out or you know say to people you're not mans you're mansplaining or something and they've turned everything into politicization. And so what happens in response to that is the so-called ignorant rednecks will have their own version of calling things out and who who is in the middle here actual people of color actual people who are <laughs> who are because it's the white liberals and and the and the rednecks are who are really at at the forefront and who actually hurts from this war between intersectionality and the rednecks is basically actual people people who are the actual workers and who become actually disaffected and who don't vote. And I mean, who, who's there to vote for in the first place? I'm not advocating necessarily uh, that we shouldn't vote or we should vote. I'm just saying that we become disaffected and uh, it should just, it shouldn't be surprising that we are disaffected, right? The illusion of consensus and unanimity, as well as the calls for anti-polities should be recognized as being fatal for democracy and therefore abandoned. The absence of 
so there needs to be a consensus and unanimity when it comes to the idea of democracy itself. So anybody who doesn't agree with democracy is and should be a, an enemy of the absence of a political frontier, far from being a sign of political maturity, is the symptom of a void that can endanger democracy. Now, here's we can also get into a little bit of a issue here because we have all the, for example, the tankies who believe in kind of a more authoritarianism or a more authoritarianism version of democracy where we have, for example, Caesar who speaks on behalf of the people. We can have that as long as there are that there is that democratic potential, right? That democratic legitimacy is more important than the actual democratic process to have a democratic legitimacy. So however that democracy works, sometimes, you know, clerical based societies, you have clerical based democracies, you have di various different types of democracies. And that's the beauty of democracy in that it's very particular. It's very particular where there is a lack of democratic political, where there is a lack of democratic political struggle with which to identify their place is taken by the other forms of, of identification, ethnic, nationalist, religious nature. And the opponent is defined in those terms too. In such conditions, the opponent cannot be per perceived as an adversary to contend with, but only as an enemy to be destroyed. This is because we have an essentialist politics, right? An ignorant essentialist politics that comes out of the prescribed intersectionality people. And the reason why I point to the prescribed intersectionality people rather than the rednecks is because these people are supposedly educated and they're absolutely not. It's just a lack of thoughtfulness when it comes to how all of these anti-racist ideas, anti-sexist ideas are being pervaded, are being pervaded. And one of the other things that I've said before is that, that it is because of this shutting up, cut off culture shut up people and cut off culture and this commodification of emotional labor that is specific to feminism that has made colored people have to swallow this affirmative action pill. We have to basically swallow that affirmative action is a good thing when deep in our hearts, many colored people think that it's out and right, outright, but because of feminism, feminism that loves infantilization, a feminism that defends infantilization, that defends the lack of responsibility that comes from a certain gender because of their historical oppression, that idea is, and when you bring it back to race, is very racist. It's a noble savage narrative. When it comes to gender, it totally works better because we have a women as wonderful idealizations and as well because a central role of the patriarchy has always been to defend the mother, to defend the sister, to defend the daughter. The patriarchy has always tried to defend women as, and that's a main role of, to, is a civilizing, the civilizing mission that the patriarchy has in the Victorian era. That in itself is tied to this idea of affirmative action through this noble savage narrative. And I bring that up as another instance of how there's this assumption of commensurability between different forms of oppression, when really you cannot see a parallel between race and gender in this sense. For in a race-based perspective, from somebody who hasn't been idealized, ideologized in the university system, like I have been, right? For people to think that they are in a situation where they are so enlightened that they totally understand why affirmative action exists in the first place is the highest form of racism. Let me say that again. For you, as a, a liberal leftist person, you are so high in your intellectual superiority that you understand why affirmative action needs to take place because you understand history. My friend, you are nothing but a civilizing colonizer. You're a colonizer. Even it doesn't matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter if you have a dick or not, you're a colonizer by saying that because you think you're better than other people. The correct way of thinking about this is to think what a normal person who hasn't gone to university thinks about affirmative action. A normal person that comes out, has some understanding of history, you could even try to convince them, right? But their initial reaction to affirmative reaction, all colored peoples, I'm speaking on behalf of everyone, all colored peoples, their initial reaction to affirmative action is that this is racist. Every colored person, every fucking colored person, their initial reaction is that this is racist. Only through a system of idealized of educational indoctrination 
do we come to a point when we start to think that, oh, it is a good thing. These people have been oppressed, blah, blah, blah. That is not the correct way. We need to look at the initial ontological reaction, the, the non-touched ontological reaction. Yeah, of course, maybe they're, they're, they were never non-touched. They're, they're, they grew up out of racism, and that's what we need to fight. That's what the argument is. But it's really not, because you can go through every country in the world, right? Depending on, you can go to the farthest places in the world. You can talk, tell them something about affirmative action. They're not going to, it doesn't feel right. Reinforce these prejudices through the back door. It just, it's not correct. But we are forced to swallow it because of feminism. Because feminism loves infantilization. Because the patriarchy creates a system where women are wonderful, where we have to defend women at all costs. The patriarchy is that, and it's a continuation. Feminism is a continuation of patriarchy in many respects. That's just one of the respects. To acknowledge that the state of nature in its Hobbesian dimension can never be completely eradicated, but only controlled, throws a different light on the status of democracy. Far from being, necessar far from being the necessary result of a moral evolution of humankind, democracy is something uncertain, improbable, and must never be taken for granted. Here we can call it more aporia rather than democracy. It is an always, it is always an, a fragile conquest that needs to be defended as well as deepened. There is no threshold of democracy that once reached will guarantee its continued existence. Democracy is in peril not only when there is insufficient consensus and allegiance to its values, but also when its agonistic, but also when its agonistic dynamic is hindered by an apparent excess of consensus, which usually masks a disquieting apathy. It is also endangered by the growing marginalization of entire groups whose status as an underclass practically puts them outside the political community. More and more people are getting pushed out of the polis. And when more and more people get pushed out of the polis, there is an uncontrolled civil war in the outside of the political sphere. When, as is the case today, liberal democracy is increasingly identified with actually existing liberal democratic capitalism and its political dimension is restricted to the rule of law, there is a risk that the excluded may join fundamentalist movements or become attracted to anti-liberal populist forms of democracy. A healthy democratic process calls for a vibrant clash of political positions and an open conflict of interest. Such is missing. It can too easily be replaced by a confrontation between non-negotiable moral values and essentialist identities, which is basically the situation we're in now. Nowadays, the crucial issue is how to establish a new political frontier capable of giving a real impulse to democracy. I believe that this requires redefining the left as a horizon where the many different struggles against subordination could find a space of inscription. The notion of a radical democratic citizenship is crucial here because it could provide a form of identification that enables the establishment of a common political identity among diverse democratic struggles. There are currently many attempts on the left to recover this idea of citizenship. But I argue in several pieces below, it is important not to aim at a neutral conception of citizenship applicable to all members of the political community. Very interesting argument here. We're going to be analyzing that argument. This is why, while being attentive to its critique of liberal individualism, I am weary of many aspects of community approaches. Its rejection of pluralism and defense of a substantive idea of the common good represents, in my view, another way of ev evading the ineluctability of antagonism. Wonderful. Now, here we get to the weeds. This is very, very interesting. And we're going to be picking up on these questions because there's going to be several books that we're going to be going through. And at the end, we're going to be coming to some conclusions. There will always be competing interpretations of the political principles of liberal democracy. And the meanings of liberty and equality will never cease to be contested. Citizenship is vital for democratic politics, but a modern democratic theory must make room for competing conceptions of our identities as citizens. Without essentializing, it's going to be difficult to do them both from different angles. The essays collected here all seek to develop various aspects of the project of radical plural democracy, but put forward in the hegemony and socialist strategy. In stressing the centrality of the idea of pluralism of, 
on modern democracy, I recognize the latter's depth to the liberal tradition. One of the main theses, theses, though, is that in order to develop fully the potentialities of the liberal ideals of individual freedom and personal autonomy, we need to disassociate them from other discourses to which they have been articulated and to rescue political liberalism from its association with economic liberalism. Now, here we have, here, here's the, I mean, here we find another attempt to, this is going to be, this, this point is a big problem, okay? And here we have another attempt at trying to do these backward flips to try to maintain certain ideas, but not others. I argue that in order to radicalize the idea of pluralism so as to make it a vehicle for deepening the democratic revolution, we have to break with rationalism, individualism, and universalism. Only on the condition it will be possible to apprehend the multiplicity. Only on that condition will it be possible to apprehend the multiplicity of forms of subordination that exists in social relations and to provide a framework for the articulation of the different democratic struggles around gender, race, class, sexuality, and other angles. This does not imply the rejection of any rationality, individuality, or universality, but affirms that they are necessarily plural, discursively constructed, and entangled with power relations. And here is the big problem. The big problem is that she just repeats the popular idioms of our time. It means acknowledging the existence of the political and its complexity, the dimension of the we, the construction of the friend's side, as well as the dimension of them, the constitutive aspect of antagonism. This is why such pluralism must also be distinguished from the postmodern conception of the fragmentation of the social, which refuses to grant the fragments any kind of relational identity. Okay, so again, more trying to keep some of this crap while not having the crap smell touch other crap. The perspective I maintain consistently rejects any kind of essentialism, either of the totality or the elements, and affirms that neither of the totality nor the fragments possess any kind of fixed identity prior to the contingent and pragmatic forms of their articulation. That's a difficult argument to make, and I don't think Moff can do that. I don't think Kant can do that, because it does not... I mean, that's basically the question of subjectivity, uh, that they're trying to question... that. I mean, that's basically the question of subjectivity that they've been trying to have for the last how many years, hundreds of years, is because it does not try to negate that the political, contrary to the other conceptions of radical or participatory democracy informed by universalistic or rationalist framework, the view that I'm advocating here is truly one of radical and plural democracy. It is the only conception that draws the full implications of pluralism of values and confronts the consequences of acknowledging and the permanence of conflict and antagonism. From such a standpoint, keyword there, standpoint is epistemology veering its head, conflicts are not seen as disturbances that unfortunately cannot be eliminated as empirical impediments that render impossible the full realization of harmony due to the fact that we will never completely coincide with our rational universal self. Okay. For a radical and plural democracy, the belief that a final resolution of conflicts is eventually possible, even if envisioned as an asymptomatic approach to the regulative ideal of a free and unconstrained communication, is, as in Habermas, far from providing the necessary horizon of the democratic project. It's something that puts it at risk. Okay, that's a terrible critique of Habermas, and this is not a very good critique of Habermas, and it's coming from standpoint epistemology perspective. Okay, so we are going to be critiquing Habermas ourselves, and we're going to be critiquing this perspective as well. Central to this approach is the awareness that a pluralist democracy contains a paradox. At the very moment of its realization would see its disintegration. It should be conceived as a good that only exists so long as it cannot be reached. Such a democracy will therefore be a democracy to come, as conflict and antagonisms are at the very same time its condition of possibility and the condition of impossibility of its full realization. Sounds like Derrida here. 